Good morning. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and I will BRB. I left my water. I'm going to try not to be noisy with this water. It crackles when you squeeze it. When I was a pastor in Kentucky, some of the deacons pulled me aside one day and were like, hey brother, you know, when you drink water from the pulpit, you throw it back really hard like Napoleon Dynamite drinking Gatorade. It's just distracting and we know you're up there to, you know. So no promises, okay. Ecclesiastes chapter two. This morning we're talking about holy disillusion. And I'll get into what I mean by that, but I think it's, it's the best way I've come up with to describe what's happening in the book of Ecclesiastes. On June 26, 2008, my daughter was born, our first child. She turned 14 last Sunday, and at her birthday shindig, I gave the same ridiculous speech I give every year at her birthday. I tell the story of the day she was born and how I held that little six pound, three ounce bean burrito in my hand, wrapped up, blonde, looking back at me, and I spoke my first words to her which were, sweetheart, Santa isn't real. (laughs) Rachel is across the room in the bed where she just, you know, delivered the child. She's just like, "Uh, what happened to me? Give me Pepsi, stat. And I'm over here. She can't interfere with me starting my daughter's life off with cynicism, which was the goal. And when I think back to that, I was 22 years old, and there's no real good explanation for why I did that. But the heart behind it might have been that I didn't want her one day to just discover the truth about St. Nick and then be like, what? Dad lied to me? No! Just get really upset and paint her fingernails black for a month. I just wanted, I wanted to avoid that moment of delusion or, or disillusion, sorry, that moment of disillusion where the truth comes crashing in and you're like, I've been lied to my whole life. Disillusion is painful to unlock my phone here to control the slides. There we go. Disillusion is painful. It is, in fact, being utterly unimpressed by something you thought would be impressive or worthwhile. It means disappointment and disenchantment, feelings that come when an experience fell short of your expectations to the extent that you're now disinterested in things with which you used to be enamored. I use this image of an archway in Jerusalem. I remember in 2010, I was passing through the old city of Jerusalem toward the Mount of Olives, and at St. Anne's Church on the left-hand side uh, of, of the road, I saw this and I thought, really? We found the place where the Virgin Mary was born, and we've commemorated it in permanent marker. <laughs> And it was good that I hadn't gone to Jerusalem to see that or I would have felt immediately like someone's lied to me. You know, a bit of disillusion. The cables are also a nice touch. Disillusion is also experienced by us when a father or a mother or a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, somebody we look up to in life, somebody who's important to us. Maybe it's a a politician or a pastor, but somebody we put on a pedestal all of a sudden does something disgraceful, and it hurts. When, when they're knocked off that pedestal, maybe they got involved in a scandal. Maybe they responded in a way to a situation that was just like, man, I have to take them out of that category of my mind where they're my hero because they just did that, right? And, and I can't look up to that. And, and for a young person especially, that kind of experience can make you feel unmoored, like you're just kind of drifting out in the water and you're not tied to anything. It's a disillusion. This, this experience of disillusion was felt by many men and has been felt by many men and women who've served in our armed forces and have returned from horrible situations. You think of, uh, of motifs like All Quiet on the Western Front where young men are getting geared up for war and they're seeing the posters and they're just 
transfixed with the idea of glory in battle and dying for one's country. And then when you get there, what they experience is just endless terrain of mud, trenches, gas hazed, bullets flying over, and the delusion, that, that grandeur of delu- uh, delusion of grandeur, sorry, that they had just kind of melts away and they're like, oh, this is what it is. And so many of our soldiers have returned to a country where they felt unmoored. They felt like they were disoriented and their priorities maybe weren't what they used to be. And sometimes we fail as a country to, to receive them back, understand where they are and help them on to, to the next thing. Disillusion is painful. This morning, actually, though, we're talking about holy disillusion, and that is the topic of the book of Ecclesiastes. Holy disillusion is being disappointed in the best the world has to offer, all the pleasures, the knowledge, professional fulfillment, when contrasted with the the simplicity of authentic living before God. The author of Ecclesiastes wants to rip the carpet, or the rug rather, uh, right out from underneath our feet. He calls himself, if you're there, he calls himself the preacher, or your version may say the teacher. Um, The word in Hebrew is kohelet, so if you hear me saying kohelet, or the preacher, or the teacher, it's all the same person. It's the person writing this book and has an important message that he wants to get across to us. Reading the book of Ecclesiastes, we did that in Sunday school this morning, is like um, jumping into a cold shower. It is terrifying. You come out of the book of Proverbs or Psalms or some other Old Testament text, and you may just have a song in your head, right? You may think, oh, God is good. God is just. There's always a happy ending because, you know, God's going to set things right, and as long as we follow the Lord, things are going to be okay. And then when you get to the book of Ecclesiastes... He's got a different perspective. In chapter one, he talks about how the sun rises and it sets, and then it goes back and does it again, and then again, and then again, on an endless cycle. He says the wind just blows on its currents, and who knows where it's going? It's just north, south, east, west. It's constantly running on its currents. He says that the streams all run into the sea, but the sea never fills up. And if you're thinking, oh, he didn't have a scientific mind, you're missing the point. He says that these phenomena in nature that go on forever and ever and ever are all the proof that he needs that what we do as humans is meaningless, which is really a hard thing for us to hear, right? We're here this morning because we believe that things are meaningful and that God has imbued life with meaning, and yet Kohelet, the preacher here, is trying to shock us out of our delusion that certain things matter that we give, that we attribute value to. He explains his purpose. If you look down in verses 12, 13, and 14, chapter 1, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. He says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I've seen everything done under the sun, and behold, all of it is vanity, meaning vapor, temporary, ephemeral, worthless, and a striving after wind. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we pray for, we pray for that, that feeling of shock that's communicated by the author of Ecclesiastes as he goes through one obsession after the next that he thought would bring him fulfillment only to find that there was nothing there that wouldn't one day erode into sand and ashes. God, help us in stripping away idols and in stripping away false promises, false hopes to see the one thing that matters. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do, folks. You're watching this in real time. I am going to find a way to turn the lock off of my phone because it keeps locking on me. Wilson should have told me about this. 
Wilson, do you know how to do this? Am I showing my age here? Passwords. Okay. Wilson, how do I turn the lock off on my phone? Wilson. Wilson. I'm, listen, I'm not against fighting you later. Okay. Could you figure that out, please? Thank you. Like I was saying, everything is vanity, including your phones. Let's get our handle, actually, you won't see it for a second, but let's get our handles on today's message. So we're in actually chapter two. So if you go to chapter two, verse one, and here we discover uh, that in Ecclesiastes chapter two, Kohelet reveals two effects of holy disillusion. My Apple ID. This is such a millennial problem. Verification failed. I know my own Apple ID. Okay. Okay, all right. Then let's do that. Thanks, Druid. So, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Kohelet reveals two effects of holy disillusion. Number one, Holy disillusion exposes false hopes. Kohelet's investigation begins. He's going to look into various avenues of life to find out, is there anything there that's worthwhile? He starts in chapter two with false hope number one, that pleasure will satisfy us. And you can go ahead to the next slide. You guys are uncomfortable, not me. Okay. False hope number one, that pleasure will satisfy us. Let's look at verses one through 10 of chapter two. Okay. I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. Of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine my heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of men to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been born, or who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of men. Kohelet describes the process of testing himself with every pleasure the human heart could conjure. I tried it all. I got the t-shirt, is what he would say. I went and collected uh, more women for my harem, is what he's saying. I collected more animals for my fields. I collected gold and silver, just amassed piles and piles of it. I built vineyards. I built palaces. Anything that entered into my heart, that last verse, anything that entered into my heart, I went and did it, seeing if that would satisfy me. Will pleasure be enough for me in life. Kohelet is that guy, which if you've witnessed this, who goes into Golden Corral for the first time maybe and just fills up a plate of brownies and there's just a mountain of brownies there. And it's terrifying if you watch this from over on the side, if you witness this go down, and then he just kind of peers over at the cheese fountain and looks back at the brownies. And you know what's about to happen. Those brownies are going into that fountain and there's nothing anyone could do to stop it, and that's why he's so happy. He says, I can just have it all, right? Kohelet goes, <laughs> Kohelet experiences all of these things and says, anything I wanted, I got. And here's what he discovers in verse 11. He says, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, 
there was nothing to be gained under the sun. It turns out that pleasure did not satisfy him. It didn't fulfill him. But beyond his own experience, what he's demonstrating is that any human endeavor, any human effort to gain ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment through pleasure is a complete waste of time. Because one day, everything that humans do, be it build palaces, pyramids, skyscrapers, empires, will all be reduced to sand and ashes. And still the sun will rise and the sun will set. He wants us to be awakened out of the stupor that we're in where we're so enamored with fulfillment through pleasure that we think that can be an end in itself. Just chasing your feelings wherever they lead you. He says, it turns out that was a complete waste of time. As believers, we know that pleasure cannot be an end in itself. We know it will not fulfill us, but sometimes we still fall for the false hope that something will save us rather than Christ. Kohelet is calling for a holy disillusionment from that. Let's move on to verse 12. Kohelet is moving from the investigation into pleasure to now an investigation into wisdom. Kohelet's read the book of Proverbs. He knows what the sages say, that where you really want to get, where, where you really want to go is to school and you want to get your wisdom you want to get your knowledge in the hebrew bible wisdom and knowledge and skillfulness are all wrapped up into one thing they don't separate it like we do like you have smart people and you have wise people it's all one thing and he wants to find out can you be happy by just being smart enough look at verses 12 and following he says then i turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly For what can a man do who comes after the king? Only what has been already done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why have I been so wise? And I saw in my heart that this also was vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there's no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten, how the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated my life, because what's done under the sun, all human endeavor, was grievous to me, all was a vanity and a striving after wind. Kohelet bemoans the fact that no matter how smart a person becomes, there is no lasting satisfaction in knowledge, and a person cannot take their wisdom with them when they die. This is a major disappointment to him, because if you go back to chapter 1, he talks about how he, how he was the wisest king Jerusalem ever had. That was his claim to fame. And now what does he discover? I'll die like any dog. One day, it'll all go, and it'll go with me, and I won't be able to take it. In other words, I can't place my value and self-worth and validation in how much I know, in how much education, or in how much wisdom I've gotten, or how much skill I've learned from a particular craft. If I put my hope in that, I'll be sorely disappointed, because one day, I'm going to leave it all behind. Somebody else is going to take it, probably somebody who worked not at all for it. He's discouraged by this discovery. As believers, we are well aware, we ought to be well aware of our cultural idol of intellect. Every fight now makes a a, a logical fallacy of appealing to authority, right? People do not think for themselves. We constantly just cite degrees and individuals We know that intellect is a false god in our society. And Kohelet is here to shake us awake, to throw cold water in our face and help us realize you can't be happy if that's all that matters to you. You will not find satisfaction there. As he's been moving from pleasure to wisdom and now to work, you may notice he's getting more impatient. When he talked about pleasure, he had this long list of things. And then he said it was all worthless. When he talked about wisdom... 
He didn't have that much to say until he just jumped right to worthlessness. And now when he switches to talk about work, can a human being find ultimate fulfillment and satisfaction in their work? He just starts out screaming. So let's look at verses 17, or excuse me, 18 and following. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he'll be wise or a fool, yet he'll be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and I gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who's toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill has to leave it all behind to be enjoyed by someone who did nothing for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What does a man have at the end of the day from all the toil and the striving of heart with which he toils under the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation, just causes anxiety. He says, even at night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. So for those of us, and sometimes you and I can slip into this mode where we get lost in our work, for those of us who struggle with thinking that our validation and our fulfillment is gonna come from our job, Kohelet has two things to say. Number one, it's ultimately just a source of anxiety. And number two, when you die, you're gonna leave it all behind and somebody else is gonna take it over, probably somebody less qualified and they're probably gonna ruin everything you worked so hard for. He's kind of depressing if you didn't pick up on that already. He just wants us to be snapped out of this false thinking that satisfaction is found, ultimate satisfaction is found in the stuff that we do under the sun, meaning on planet earth. That it has to be, the truth has to be more simple. The truth has to be different in Kohelet's mind. I was watching a television show recently where one of the characters had a heart attack and was laying on the hospital bed and Um, recovering and one of his friends runs into the room and goes to his bedside and says hey are you okay you okay he says I just saw my life flash before my eyes she's like well what did you what did you learn did you pick up anything from all this experience he says yeah I learned that that I just have one regret I should have worked more (laughs) and it's meant to be it's meant to be sad (laughs) because his whole worth and validation is wrapped up in what he does in what he produces for an employer or a boss and getting that thumbs up or that star on a chart there was a poem that I read in high school many of us may have read it and it is called Ozymandias by Percy Shelley what this poem represents it's on the right side of the screen What this poem represents is something that was very well known to Kohelet. As a king, he was very familiar with the practice of setting up a giant stone that has all of these words across it saying, I am the king of such and such, I've accomplished X, I've run all of my enemies out of town, I'm the rightful king, you should worship me, you should pay taxes to me. This propaganda in the ancient world. And this poem kind of captures that sense. It says, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. On the left hand of the screen is is sort of an image of that poem. There's a king named Kilimua, who in his inscription describes how his father, His father's father, his brother, were all losers who accomplished nothing, but how he has accomplished everything. So pay your taxes, is what he'd say at the end of the day. Kohelet is disillusioned to kingship. He says, this is all a lie. This is all false. The idea of human beings accomplishing something that lasts 
uh, more than a few years is a complete delusion. He wants to strip us away from this idea of finding ultimate meaning in worthless things. As believers, we can place too much value on our work because we too easily lose sight of how temporary this all is and how insignificant, ultimately insignificant, our contributions are. Kohelet wants us to become unenamored with the idea of professional fulfillment. So what does he leave us with? Kohelet has taken all of our toys, all the stuff we like. He's taken pleasure away from us. He's taken just being really smart away from us. That's not something you can be fulfilled with. He's taken work away from us. You can't wrap your identity up in just what you do and expect to be happy. So what's left at the end of the day? The answer for what matters in life that he gives us next is a little underwhelming because it's so simple. It's so simple we look past it every day with our worries and our concerns and our craving for validation. He just wants us to live authentically before God. Look at verses 24 to 26. He says, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases God, God's given him wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he's given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. At the end of the day, what Kohelet wants us to adopt is an appreciation for things that are simple in life that just come right from the hand of God right into our lap. Eating, drinking, finding enjoyment in our work. Not ultimate fulfillment in any one of those things. What he describes is living our lives with an open hand, knowing God's gonna place things in our hand and take it out, and place things in our hand and take it out. But sometimes when God places something in our hand, we start to tighten our grip a little bit because we fall under the delusion that that thing is as good as God himself, and he has to tear it away from us, which is painful for us. But really the sin started when we thought that something else other than God, other than the simple things that God gives us, was going to ultimately fulfill us in this life. He wants us to be disillusioned to these things and turn to authentic living. Turns out that the best thing to do is to live our lives simply, living life with an open hand, not knowing what will come, but being thankful for all of it. One of the great benefits of Rachel and I moving home uh, to live near family here in Virginia a couple of years ago that I didn't necessarily anticipate was me just sending my kids off to their grandparents' house and enjoying a quiet, empty house. But knowing that when they're at their grandparents' house, like when they're at Rachel's parents' house, they could be scooping manure. <laughs> they could be bailing hay. They're out there just driving posts. They're doing simple, authentic, real things that are just dealing with the daily needs of life and sort of torn away from delusions of grandeur. I want more of that. I want more simplicity. I want more authentic living I want to just wake up and smack myself out of <laughs> any false path I start my day on where I think that will fulfill me and instead go, whatever you bring, God, you bring. I want to be happy right now in the moment. And Kohelet wants that for us. He wants us to be smacked out of our false thinking. This is very, very, very difficult for us to do. Paul says in Philippians 4.13, uh, Pastor Thurman preached on this not that long ago. He says that he found that whether he had a lot of stuff or he had nothing, he found whether he was rich or poor, fed or hungry, clothed or cold, he found that he could be content because it is Christ who strengthens me. Jesus is the missing component between us being completely obsessed and deluded by what this world has to offer and the simple, authentic living that Kohelet wants us to adopt. 
for us to let go of all that stuff and obsession with it and thinking that we can control the outcomes of the world, we have to hand it over to Jesus and say, you're the only one big enough to deal with that. If, if, you, if I get a job promotion, it's from the hand of the Lord, right? If, if my problems get solved, it's from the hand of the Lord. All that I can do right now is just prepare what's for lunch <laughs> or what do we need to accomplish today? How do I just move simply into receiving things from the Lord with an open hand by trusting in Jesus. Jesus, who died on the cross, bore the weight of our sin, was buried and rose again after three days for the forgiveness of all of us toiling sinners who are eager to get onto a hamster wheel hoping to earn God's love and favor. Jesus alone, at the end of the day, We want to say, all I have in my hands is Christ. All That's all I have. Everything else will perish. All I have is Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. God, you give us many gifts, but we are foolish children. And too often, even right now in our lives, there are things we think we can't live without that. Or we will be fulfilled and validated and seen as good enough if we have X. Strip us, God, of all such delusions. Leave us only in our minds and hearts with you as the all-sufficient provider of our souls. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.